fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Third on MCK, 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Well, welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren, Mr. Dave Martino. Yes. Yeah, he's <laughs> sitting somewhere. somewhere. You, you finished dig, digging digging that tunnel yes, yet? Yes, I've dug the tunnel. You know? You know? Hey, you know, I found out how she was getting rid of the dirt. Oh, did you? Yeah. She was putting it in her garbage. Oh, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Which, but it's kind of funny because... So she wasn't walking around the area with it. Yeah, like escape from Alcatraz. Out of her yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Craziness, you know? And the neighbor's house is shaky. I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> she's taking down more than one house. Yeah, she's she's oh, no. uh, she's causing trouble. But she started a whole trend, so... But you, you have a job to do. Get it done. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got a small little time. metal shovel and... Yeah, we're running out of time. 24. <laughs> That's right. Gonna they go hide. <laughs> yeah. yeah, speaking of hiding. Okay, so now we've got an author here, and he writes mystery books, and he's got a little bit of a history with mystery. Huh. Funny. Anyway, his, his <laughs> new book, Broadcast Blues, Claire Carlson Mystery Book 6, and we call him R.G. Balski. So thank you for being here. Hey, uh, great to uh, jo- join you two. Hopefully you say that in, uh, in a half hour. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm a little apprehensive, but uh, I'm going to try and make sure that this goes, that we all get out of this okay. Yeah, well, you know, I do have a reputation. I've heard a lot of, I've heard a lot of, a lot of people told me, don't come on this show, or, you know, but uh, I'm a tough guy, so I'm going to give it a shot. Yeah, I, not too many people cry. They usually just hang up and run. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's all good. It's all good. So, So listen, so this is book six of this mystery series. What got you into writing crime fiction? Because because I guess you were a journalist in New York before. Real life crime is what got me into it. Uh, I went from covering real life crime to writing crime fiction because I basically uh, discovered it's a lot easier to write crime fiction because you can basically make everything up. Uh, You know, I I was a longtime journalist in New York, uh, and that has been my main career. Uh, I've covered everything. I mean, it goes all the way back to when I was starting out. I covered Son of Sam, the O.J. Simpson trial, uh, you know, all, all the big crimes, Central Park Jogger, you know, so many things that happened in New York and, uh, and nationally. And uh, at some point, I started writing uh, fiction, sort of ripped from the headlines, as they say, out of these crimes. Most of my books you'll find you know, are inspired by some real life event. And then I sort of just take it, you know, about a hundred steps beyond that for a fictional kind of thing. And again, it's because, you know, I don't have to chase facts like I did as a journalist. I can uh, just, uh, I can just make stuff up. No, and it's easier. I get it. Cause I write, um, a lot of true crime myself, or I have done that and I'm going into fiction. I, I think the advantage too is in fiction you can tr- control how it turns out because quite often in real life, it doesn't turn out as, like it, it should. Catch the murderer. You can solve the crime. You know, it's, uh, uh, I always tell the story that um, in all my years in journalism, I worked at the New York Post, New York Daily News. I worked with NBC News. Uh, I worked at a few other places. In all my years in journalism, not only did I never do this, I never knew one incident in which a reporter solved a murder. Never. I mean, you know, maybe with the police, but a reporter solving a murder on their own, I've never remembered anything like that. In my books, you know, my character, Claire Carlson, she solves a murder every book, sometimes more than one murder. So, you know, that's that's so you can you can do a lot of stuff that you uh, that you can't do uh, when you're when you're really writing uh, news in a newsroom, which is what I did for so many years. With you saying that, do do you need to take liberties with what a journalist can do um, and what they can do kind of in the newsroom itself too to make a thriller work? Oh, of course. I mean, uh, uh, people will say to me, uh, one of the great things about your books are you, you, sh- you really show us what a newsroom is like, you know, what it's really happens. And that's, you know, completely untrue because in my books, 
a newsroom is like an exciting place, and there's always a big story breaking, and my character is telling the boss, I don't care what you say, I'm going to break this story. You know, and it's like a great, exciting life. You know, in a real-life newsroom, it's like a lot of jobs. Uh, a lot of it's very boring, very dull. I mean, you're sitting around drinking coffee, trying to figure out what you're going to do all day, uh, and nobody wants to read that. So uh, <laughs> you, know, you, you take so many – and also you take liberties in the way you cover the story. Um, just like I was saying about a reporter solving it, I mean, my reporter, you know, does things with the police that no real reporter would do. I mean, she – takes evidence, she steals evidence, she she uses maneuvers to get to get uh, stuff. Um, now I didn't work for I didn't work for like the New York Times or the Washington Post. I worked for the New York Post and the New York Daily News. And these are New York City tabloids. And if you know much about New York City tabloids, you know they're very aggressive and they push the envelope a lot to get a story. Um, so, you know, it wasn't it wasn't like we weren't doing a lot of wild stuff when I was in a real newsroom. But having said that, um, I up I up the ante tremendously uh, in my books because <laughs> you know, like who'd read them if I didn't? Well, yeah, if you told the truth, people would be bored. They much <laughs> rather get into a conspiracy too. I mean, uh, people really don't have a clue of what goes on in studios and and um, and you know, newspaper places and magazines. They sort of have that ideal that everything's all excitement and running around and also um one of the things that i find and and a lot of this i think came from back in the days of you know old president's men which inspired many people in journalism it's like that journalism is this which it is in many ways is a very noble profession and that you're you're trying to make the world a better place and you know to a degree you are but I mean, the truth of it is most journalists don't go to work every day and say, oh, how can I make the world a better place today? I want to do something good for humanity. They're trying to get a story to, like, hold on to their job. I, I always say, and I've written about this, that the biggest motivation that I ever remember in a newsroom, both myself and a lot of people, is fear. I mean, you go to work every day just afraid you're going to get beat. You know, the opposition is going to have the big story you didn't have, and you're either going to get yelled at or you lose your job or whatever. And a lot of what happens in the newsroom is very practical like that. It's it's can we get the story first? Can we get the ratings? Can we get circulation? I mean, this was in the days when, you know, newspapers sold a lot of newspapers. I was at the New York Post. We could sell about a million copies a day if we had the right story. So there's a lot of pressure and a lot of stress put on you to uh, – to to meet those meet those kind of goals. That's just the reality of it. And some of that, a lot of that, is what I try and convey uh, in my books. This kind of the the intensity and the stress of it. And one of the things you'll find in the Claire books is the the toll this takes on her the rest of her life. Um, I always basically say that you know Claire's a terrific journalist and a great kind of leader in a newsroom, and she does her job great. But her personal life's a train wreck. I mean, divorces, bad romances, bad decisions. Because, you know, it's very hard to do it all, and, and something suffers. And I just know a lot of people like Claire who get so caught up in the media uh, pressures um, that they have to sacrifice other parts of their life. So those are a big part of what goes on in my books, too. The people forget that they're real human beings, but like, like your journalist, Claire Carlson, is – She's a real human, just like all the others. Like when you're working, you're a real human. You got your relationship, your life, your house, your parents, your kids, whatever. There's well, like I said, I think I think I really work on that a lot in my books. Uh, my books operate on the theory, and you know, not all not all books do this, which is there's the story, which is important. There's the mystery and who killed who and all that. But the the, the overriding thing in my book is the character. It's about the character. Uh, I care more about the character, actually, than I even do about the story. I think my stories are pretty good. But if I don't have the Claire character right, um, then I don't think I, I, I have a good book. And that's just based on, you know, what started me writing. What would I read? I would read, you know, Raymond Chandler and Philip Marlowe or, Ro or Robert Parker and Spencer, or Michael Conley and Harry Bosch, uh, uh, Sue Grafton and Kinsey Malone. And it was always the character that brought me back. You know, it wasn't the story. So... Um, it's, it's, I've tried to create Claire as a real human being, and, and to do that, of course, one of the most important things you have to do in any character is to give them flaws. Uh, and, you know, she's a very flawed character. Um, so you have to give them enough flaws that people can relate to them and say, yeah, you know, that's just like me. I have that same problem. But on the other hand, you don't want to make them so flawed that they're, uh, 
they're unlikable. So that, that that's a that sometimes is a tough balance to uh, to reach. Who is Claire Carlson then? How would you describe her? Uh, she is a woman who started out as a newspaper reporter and actually won a Pulitzer when she was very young. Uh, she uh, wound up going into TV work when all the newspapers started fading, but her 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 principles and her heart is still in newspapers. So even though she's in TV. And that's very much sort of like what I went through in a career because I spent most of my life in newspapers and then wound up in TV news at the end. And even though it can be very exciting, uh, you still always feel well, like newspapers are pure in terms of like the journalism. And so Claire brings a lot of those values to a TV newsroom, which aren't always welcome by the people in charge because they're looking for the ratings and the ad, and the ad revenue and, and they don't care as much sometimes about the journalism. Uh, she's uh, at this point in the series. She is in her late forties, uh, so you know she's not a kid anymore, which I think adds to some of the things you can deal with her in terms of what her anxieties and stuff are, especially with the idea of a woman uh, growing older in the media, which can be tough, as I'm sure you understand. Um, and one of the focuses of this book is she has her fiftieth birthday coming up, and you know it's really kind of bothering her a lot, both on a personal level, like, where is my life, and uh, on a professional level, like, you know, what's going to happen to me as I get older. And she keeps looking to some of the other women, uh, you know, like Gail King and Diane Sawyer and people like that who are older in TV news and have still managed to, you know, survive um, as a kind of an inspiration. So, uh, but that's that's who she is. And, you know, I think she, you know, I've written her as somebody, I always say, she's somebody I would like to hang out with. You know, I, I think she's fun and interesting. But then why would I write a character that I didn't think was <laughs> interesting? <laughs> well, you mentioned uh, earlier motivation for journalists. What what drives Claire? Is it, is it uh, fear and pressure, as you said, or curiosity, sense of justice? What is it? Yeah, it's all those in the, in the book. Uh, with Claire, it's like, because it's fiction, when I was talking about the fear, I was talking more about, like, real-life journalists like myself. I mean, I would go to work in the morning and be like, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of times you go to work like, oh, my God, I hope I don't screw something up today kind of thing, you know. Uh, with Claire, uh, I don't have as much of that because it's fictional and, you know, so she doesn't have to be afraid particularly. Uh, in her case, it's the love of the big story. Um, I have a recurring line in the big, in in these books where she, whenever she has a problem in her life, you know, whether it be a family issue or or, or romantic issue or any kind of an issue, health issue, anything, she always says a big story makes everything better, and that's sort of the way she operates. That she throws herself into a big story, she can kind of forget all the other like outside influences on her life and be happy. And uh, so she embraces her job and the story, uh, not just because she loves it, but also because it it's the one thing she knows how to do, even though when she doesn't know how to do some other things in her life. Uh, she also, you know, probably more than most real-life journalists, including me, uh, does have a real sense of integrity and justice. So even though she'll cut corners and push the envelope on a story, uh, she always, she always kind, kind of wants to do the right thing and do the moral thing. You know, I, I think that she's, you know, with all her flaws, um, I think she's basically a good person. And that, that's, that's kind of what, um, you know, what, what I wanted to, you know, if I had a, you know, people say, well, who do you, all the characters you base on, and, you know, there's like Spencer and Harry Bosch and Kinsey Malone. But I, I think in many ways when I write Claire, I think about my favorite TV detective of all time, which was Jim Rockford from the Rockford Files. And he's like a totally flawed character, you know, and he would always get stuff screwed up and messed up. But he was a good guy. And, you know, in the end, he always did the right thing, even though he never really made any money on it. And, you know, I watched those for years. And, and I just feel a lot of times I'm running Claire, I can feel a little of the Rockford Files in my mind and, and see her in that kind of a, in that kind of a role. Well, how do you describe your relationship with Claire then? Like, when you're writing uh, that character, do you hear her voice? Do you see her like a movie? What kind? How do you tackle the dialogue? Yeah, I love writing dialogue. I, I don't particularly like writing descriptions. So my books are very dialogue heavy. Um, it's uh, I think it's something I'm good at. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, I I like listening to other people dialogue around me. So one of the one of the ways I write books, and this is pretty unusual for an author, I don't sit 
in my house or in an office or in a library, even somewhere in a quiet place working on a book. I like to work with people talking all around me. And I think I'm sure this comes from the fact that I spent so many years working in a newsroom where people were screaming and yelling and throwing phones and typewriters and computers and stuff everywhere. Um, so when I write, I, I, I literally every day I go to the house, go to the house and I go somewhere. I either go to like a, a coffee shop. I've written, yeah, I read a lot in coffee shops. Uh, I've written on, you know, the beach. I've written in parks. I write, I've written in, in bars. I've written on subway trains. I like to, you know, I write it out longhand and later I come back and I, and I, type it up on the computer or whatever. I, I like that energy of people around me, and I sort of, I think, I, I absorb some of the inflection of what people are saying, and I just think it helps make Claire's dialogue uh, good. You know, one of the things, the positive things that I generally get from the books is almost everybody always says, you know, like the, the back and forth and the dialogue and the banter is, is really good and really, you know, realistic or whatever, even though it's not really realistic. But, um, you know, and, and, and that's fun. And it's fun to write Claire's, you know, like to, to write that kind of stuff for Claire because she, she basically has this big mouth, will say anything to anybody. She doesn't really have a filter on her mouth. And it's like uh, I always think, even though she's not really like that, I always think of like the Larry David show, Curb Your Enthusiasm, where he says all these outrageous things to people that, you know, none of us would ever say, but it's funny because – you know he's he's doing it, and and I think there I do think that there is a um, and a lot of us just wish we could do that. Uh, uh, I, I once uh, Robert Parker once said about Spencer that one of the appeals of Spencer is that he says he says the things to people that we all want to say to somebody, but we don't think of it till after we've left and we said I should have said that. Well, Spencer says it at the moment, and. I think I try and get Claire to do that, too. And it's fun. You know, it's fun to do it when she tells her boss, you know, some, you know, some smart, smart remark that none of us would ever tell our bosses or something or or has some flippant remark to, you know, about a boyfriend or something. And um, and I think it's interesting. But, yeah, it's fun to write. I I I, I enjoy it. And uh, I guess I get to live a little vicariously through through Claire. Gee, I live my life that way. <laughs> I still haven't got canceled yet. Yet, I say that. and I like all the noise myself. I'm the same way. I've got to have ten TVs going and lots of noise around. You know, that's... I can't do TV. It's funny because one of when I first started writing, I one of the biggest things I had to do was put my where I worked away from a TV because I'm such a TV you know aficionado that if the TV's on. I'll just get lost, and, and I can watch anything on TV pretty much, you know. Uh, and uh, so uh, I try not to uh, – I, I try to be in an area where I'm not watching TV. But I, I do listen to uh, music constantly when I'm – like, so if I'm working at home, like, typing something up, uh, I'll have, uh, you know, music blasting uh, the whole time. I'm not sitting in a quiet room, so I, I just – again, like you, I guess, that's just – each to his own, but that's that, that's just what works for me. And so what's it like writing for you, a female lead character? Like, how do you get into that head? Well, I was waiting for that question because that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to ask it because if I don't. You know, everybody thinks that, uh, <laughs> everybody thinks about a lot of these things that, they're, they're, they're always a well-thought-out plan, you know, and I like to convey that somehow. Oh, yeah, you know, I did research, and I found that if I wrote this or that, most of what you do in life, or in the books, but just like in life, it just it just happens for reasons. This goes back years and years when I started writing for the first time, and I decided to try and write a mystery for the first time. I had read Raymond Chandler, I'd read Philip Marlowe, I went, oh, this is really cool, I'm going to try and write a mystery. And I started writing a book, and I had a newspaper reporter, and, you know, he was a man, you know, a real guy, and he was sort of a, he had some kind of a hat, and very traditional male reporter, and, um, uh, I showed it to a woman friend of mine who was actually in publishing, and she was like, "Oh, you know, this is this is good. This is it's really good. It's good." But she said, "You know, just reading it, like you know, it reads like a lot of other. Like, wouldn't it be more interesting if you made the reporter a woman instead of a man?" And this was 
back in the days when women weren't weren't really as prevalent in the media business as they are now. You know, there was still a lot of, you know, like, well, they have to cover features and cooking. And, you know, it wasn't like it is now where where women are, you know, doing all sorts of things. And by making it a woman, you, you have her facing more challenges. And I went, oh, okay, let me let me try that. So I went back and I made the character a woman. And it made the book just sort of come alive. And I eventually sold that book. And uh, since then... I have done uh well this will be this book that just came out Broadcast Blues which is the uh, which is the one I'm trying to sell but I don't know if I've said the title but it's Broadcast Blues people and uh uh Broadcast Blues uh <laughs> uh is the 21st book I've written and I think about 15 of those have, fe- have featured a female character and I-, I don't know exactly why I did write a series with a male character uh before this and you know that was fine um, but there's just a lot of opportunities when you have a female to do a lot of things that you can't do with a male that don't seem like, oh, yeah, there's just one more male, you know, character. There's so many. Um, and I, 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 it just, in many ways, has just seemed more interesting. Now, the other issue is writing the, uh, so my books are all in the first person. Uh, I've never written a female character in the third person. I've never written, well, I've never published any book in the third person. And people ask me why. And why don't you ever write in the third person? And my answer is, I do write in the third person. I've written a lot of, I've written other books in the third person, but they've never gotten published, which may say something about them. I think I write better in the first person. So I'm writing a female and I'm writing it in the first person. I'm not the only person in the world to do that, but it is, it is unique. And, you know, you, you have to be careful about a lot of things. You know, uh, you have to be, mainly you have to make sure that you capture the, 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 the feeling of what a woman would say and you know and and this comes up you know this is something I do think about when I'm writing it and I've been very fortunate because so far I, I pretty much every woman reader who's read it has you know raved about the character and they say wow you do a great you capture her great and everything so if they didn't say that then I'd know I'd have a problem but um, you know many many women more women than men probably have become fans of Claire and they all like oh I want to be like Claire like she's so cool and that's great uh, but I do have a woman, uh, I do have a female agent, and I have a woman, I've had a woman editor for all the Claire books, and, uh, and I do depend on them to let me know if I'm, if I've, you know, if I've gone, if I've strayed in the wrong way. And there are times when, uh, you know, they'll say, well, you know, I don't know that a woman would react like that. And I always listen to them, you know, when that happens. Um, and maybe the trickiest moment I ever did, the book be, well, two books before this one, I got Claire very involved in the Me Too movement, uh, which was very prevalent at the time I was writing it, involving, you know, you know, women coming forward and claiming sexual abuse and attacks and things. And uh, I was very concerned about that, that I handled that properly. And again, you know, the women who read it were all like very positive, like that it had been done, you know, well. So. That's it. But again, it's not a well thought out plan. I mean, I don't sit, set out saying, "Oh, I have to write a woman character." But when I write the books, um, it just always seems to work out better with a woman. So that's that's what I've been doing. That's interesting. Now, in your your series books, how do you keep track of uh, continuity? Do you, do you have a series bible? Do you have tool no, systems? No, no, very badly. That's it. <laughs> I'm, I know I'm terrible like at a lot of those things. I'm terrible at doing research, <laughs> at keeping track. Uh, oh, it's, it, it's, it, 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 it gets worse too with each book. So like if you write a book and then you write a second book in the series, well, you can sort of remember. I, I'm on my sixth book, you know, and, um, I have made a few minor mistakes. I, I once went to a, uh, a book signing event, and there was this woman who was this giant aficionado fan of the Claire books. And she said, well, I love the books, but um, in this book you've got, like, I don't know, somebody's – well, actually, it was not Claire. It was another book, but you've got the character's name wrong. And I said, no, no, it's right there. That's right. And she said, yeah, it's right in this book, but three books ago you called that person somebody else, and you're like, oh, my God. You know, like only one person would <laughs> – but it's tough. And uh, I, I constantly have to go back and and check and make sure that there's a there's, – now, all these books are standalones in the sense that you can read them without, you know, having read the previous ones, but – you obviously make references to some of the of the earlier stuff. The other interesting thing about that that I just thought about when you were asking me about the, the continuity of a series is 
I've never, um, I've never done a, I've done, well, three series, th three big series now, um, one back in the 90s, but two recently. I've never done a series where I started out doing it as a series. All of these books, like with the Claire books, um, it was originally a standalone thriller. Um, and it, it, without getting into the plot, because I don't want to give it away, it involves something very personal in Claire's life, that something that had happened to her personally led to her stumbling onto this huge story. But it was, it was, it was a very personal thing that could only happen to a woman, and so I needed to write this character, and I created this Claire Carlson character with the idea that that would be it. It would be a one-book, standalone kind of thing. Um, and when I sold a book uh, to Ocean View Publishing, uh, that was my idea. And then I got on the phone with the owner, uh, uh, and uh, uh, she said to me, uh, well, we're going to change the title. The original title was, I think, Forget Me Not. And she said, we're going to call it Yesterday's News. The reason being... We want it to have a media sound so it'll go with the rest of the books in the series. And, of course, my response was, what series, you know? And she said, <laughs> well, you're planning on writing a series on this character, aren't you? And, you know, there was a brief pause in which I went, absolutely, sure. What's that, you know? And afterward, I called my agent and I said, did you know they want a series on this? And she said, no. I said, well, they do now, you know, so that's how the series got. But it isn't like you set out doing, like I've had people come to me, writers, people firing writers, which is another whole topic. People have all these ideas about how they're going to be a writer, which is, a lot of it is just so crazy and pie in the sky. But uh, people come to me and say, well, I've got an idea for a series. Now, you don't really have an idea for a series. You have an idea for a book. And if the book is successful, then it could lead to a series. But, uh, you know, I've, I've, never, I've never set out with the idea that this is going to be a series. And, uh, you know, that's what happened with Claire. And now I'm on book six of a series. So whatever I did worked. Well, how do you keep it fresh? Like, when, you know, when you're doing it over a period of books like that. Well, that's, that's there's a, there's two sides to that. Um, one of which is yes, you want to keep it fresh, but the other hand, you don't want to change it too much because you know people like the thing. I mean, you know, like you look at some of the big series that I follow, like Spencer with Robert Parker or Harry Bosch with Michael Conley. I mean, there's like forty books in these series. Um, I mean, Spencer throughout the series really doesn't change that much. He's got the same girlfriend, Susan pretty much does the same things all the time. He's got the PI office in, in Boston. Uh, Harry Bosch changes a little more during the series, but it's a balance, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, like, I don't know, you, read, you know, James Bond. I mean, does James Bond really change from movie to movie, or is he, other than the actor, isn't he do some of the same kind of things? That's what people like. So um, it's a balance you have to reach. Now, in my, in my books, um, one of the things I'll do is change the newsroom people. So I, I always have her sort of surrounded by colorful people in the newsroom. Uh, so a lot of the book will relate to her dealing with that as well as the, the mystery, because people seem to, to enjoy that. But that can get a little stagnant, and you sort of start telling the same story over and over again. So the biggest change I made, well, not in this one, but in the last two books, is I originally had her boss being this kind of kindly old mentor who had given her a job, and, you know, and he adores her and lets her do whatever she wants and I decided to can him so I basically can him I fire him in the book and I replace him with uh, a woman horrible woman who I, I describe basically in the book says the editor from hell uh, she's just like like a horrible human being a terrible editor ambitious backstabbing and um, you know I did that specifically because I thought it would be good to have that dynamic for Claire, to have suddenly her world turned upside down and her boss not be this guy that she looked up to, but to be this jerk that she hated and she still had to do had to do the job. But I, I don't know. People, one of the questions everybody, like a lot of interviewers like yourself will always ask is, well, tell us how Claire has changed during the series. And I, I don't know. I don't know how much she's actually changed. I still, I think she's basically the same person as she started out being. Um, so I don't. I think to some degree that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's how you do it. Are, are you conscious of how you write um, the violence in the series or the suspense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's two. There's two topics there that are similar: uh, violence and sex. 
Um, uh, uh, I I don't do either one in detail. I don't like either one in detail when I'm reading books, and I don't do either one in detail when I'm writing them. Uh, in terms of the violence, um, I don't uh, I don't like I don't have someone being tortured or, or brutally murdered too much. You know, and there was the specifics of you know stabbing them over and over in the in the horrific. Uh, most of my violence takes place, you know, off screen, as you would say, or not in the book. Like they find a body that's been mutilated or something, as opposed to um, describing the violence. I, I don't think I really do that too much. And with sex, I, I really do the same thing. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just not comfortable writing about it. But I don't, I don't do a play by play of. of everything that happens in the bedroom. I basically have Claire, and she sleeps around a lot. That's one of the critics I've, criticisms I've gotten. She's like, she's, she sleeps around too much. She's got to stay with one man. But um, but uh, uh, basically, she'll meet somebody. She'll go home with them or take them home. Um, they'll, you know, they'll have banter and everything, and then they'll go to, in the bedroom, and then, you know, I generally will have them waking up the next morning after sex. Um, I don't give all the details, so... Uh, um, if you're looking for sex and the violence, you're probably not going to find them in my books. You'll find references to them, but um, um, and I, like I said, I I just find that like when I'm reading like a thriller, anything by somebody really good, and there's this horrific torture or somebody being held captive while terrible things are done to them, I uh, I don't want to read that. So I kind of write. I always feel like I try and write what I want to read, and that that's. That, that's what I that's what I do in the Claire books. These are like the kind of books I would like to read. So I figure, hey, there's probably a lot of other people out there that might want to read them just like me. You can always have an X-rated version. <laughs> <laughs> Not my Claire, no way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh please, she sleeps around. Come on. Yeah, you know? that's not. Yeah, huge. come on. I, I like to think she's sort of a little bit like uh, you know, like in. Uh, Seinfeld, we had a different girlfriend every weekend, or even the rock. My, we talked about the rock girlfriend. She always had the girlfriend, and then the next episode she would be gone. Because that's another thing; it's very difficult to do in a series is to have. I mean, you can't really have a, a long-standing happy relationship. I mean, Spencer did with Susan, but that was a little strange. But you know, I mean, nobody really wants to see people. Most people don't want to see people, you know, being happily married and living happily ever after. I mean, I, I think. I think her search for the right man is part of the dynamic of, of what makes the books work. Well, and so, so your extra characters, how do you get your fill-in characters? Where do they come from? Are they people you kind of know, or is it from the coffee shop you're sitting at? Yeah, all of that. Uh, one of the toughest things, uh, you know, with writing all the characters around Claire is that you have to make them different than Claire. In other words, you can't have five different Claires in the book. Uh, so if Claire is this, so like in, in my books, uh, she has a best friend, this woman, Janet Wood, who's like an attorney. And Janet Wood is the exact opposite of Claire, where Claire's kind of like a mess and she's all over the place and she's always in all sorts of trouble and her life is in turmoil. Uh, Janet is this very successful lawyer and she's got, you know, happily married and she's got two beautiful young kids and she always has, seems to be in control of everything and they're complete opposites, which kind of makes them best friends. And so I'm able to use her friend Janet as kind of a sounding board. So when Claire is really upset about something, she goes to Janet, who kind of tries to, you know, calm her down and get her on the straight and narrow. Um, and I think, you know, that kind of opposite stuff. And then the people in the um, in the newsroom, uh, you got to make them all kind of different. Because and one of the things is like the dialogue. You've got to make them – I don't write in, you know, I don't write in some dialect. I don't have somebody talking like heavy Italian or something or – or, but, uh, but, but they all have to sound different than Claire. Um, and that's something that a lot of writers, you know, always point out. Like, you just don't, you don't want all your characters to sound alike. And Claire has a real, has a real unique, you know, whatever feel to her. But I take this as a compliment. A number of people who know me who've read Claire, they say, you know, Claire sounds like you. She said she just sounds very much like you would be talking if you were Claire. Um, so I have to find people that aren't talking like me, <laughs> which is pretty easy to do. But uh, so I have a cast of characters, and you know, again, I, if I had to compare, I'm, you know, I'm a TV aficionado. Um, 
you know, I, I think sometimes I try and, you know, create a, a kind of like a Mary Tyler Moore newsroom at, you know, at WJM and it used to be with, you know, Ted Knight and Murray and all the kind of wacky. Betty White. Betty White, yeah, yeah. Sue Evans. Uh, and, you know, just that, that Claire is surrounded by a lot of wacky people. And like in this book, you know, she's got a, she's got a husband, she's got a, a, a man and woman anchor team who left their, who, who left their own spouses to get married because they fell in love and now they're getting divorced. So there's all romantic tension. I've got a, I've got a, I've got a weatherman who, uh, who's constantly trying to get things like helicopters, because, driving Claire nuts, like, oh, we have to buy a helicopter for the station. And, you know, she's like, well, if we're going to invade a foreign country, that's fine. Otherwise, no helicopter. Uh, I've got a, woman sports uh, caster that they brought on for, you know, diversity reasons who decides she doesn't like to cover big sports like football, which drives Claire crazy because, you know, what is she, what is she there for? Um, and I, and I really try and have, and, and like I said, I have this boss from hell who drives Claire nuts every day. Um, so that's a big part of it. And yeah, you, you just got to create. So some of these are, I will say that the boss from hell is based on. <laughs> okay, here we based go. On, <laughs> based on a few boss. From, so I, 98% of all the bosses I work for have been great. But of the 2% that I worked for who weren't, uh, I drew on many of those qualities to uh, create this character. And I, I really did. I was kind of like, you know, like who, what what would make a boss just a terrible person to work for? And I thought about a couple that I didn't like particularly, and I put them into this character, Susan Endicott's her name, and uh, I think it works, you know. So you know, it, and it's 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 easy to write <laughs> when you when you're writing about you know horrible people. It's uh, it's the and well the other part of that too is the villains. You know, how do you write your how do you write your bad guys? Um, they got to be interesting too. You know, you can't have a one dimensional bad person. I mean, the best kind of a book is when you think somebody's a good guy and they turn out to be a bad guy, or the other way around. You think they're a bad guy and they turn out to be a good guy. Um, but th that's a part of it, too. You know, they, they, they you, you just can't have the one-dimensional murderer. Uh, there's got to be a lot more going on in, in, in the book. Yeah, you kind of got to explain where their head's at, why they do what they do, kind of, you know. But I want to get back to some names of bosses that you didn't like. We can get them on the line here and <laughs> Bring them on for a debate. <laughs> yeah, no, most of them, I've, uh, I, uh, I, I, I worked with a lot of great people, and so I spent 13 years, uh, and people are always amazed by this, I spent 13 years working with uh, Rupert Murdoch when he owned the New York Post, and uh, people will be like, oh, wow, that must have been whatever, but, you know, and I'm like, he was the best boss, you know, because he was actually in those days, he was very hands-on, he would come down to the newsroom, and he would... You know, he would like talk to us about headlines and stories. Best boss I ever worked for, you know, and uh, you know, like now he's gone on to obviously be what he is, but um <laughs> the wonderful he he was great. He was just uh, it was just thir you know, and I spent like you say about a decade, more than a decade, uh working with him. So it's not always the people that you think are, are gonna be I, I really did work with a lot of uh, a lot of, of good bosses. And if any of the people out there who were my bosses and think I'm talking about them uh, then I was just kidding. I made I made up all the bad stuff. They're probably <laughs> right. Well, have you killed off anybody in in, in of your real life in your books? In real life, I yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, let's get a confession. Life, you know that I know of anyway. You know, uh, there's a few people I wouldn't mind, but you know, but I've never actually done that. You know, my 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 murders are all are all um, are all fictional. You know. But, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think of that. I've never thought of that question. But uh, that's an interesting thing to do, though, actually. Like, 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 let's just say, for argument's sake, that I got really annoyed with you guys. And, uh, and then afterwards I wrote a book and I had, you know, two radio hosts who died this horrible, mysterious death. That could be very satisfying, you know. Yeah, and yes. it's been done before. Yeah. <laughs> and, and make it painful. Yes, and long. <laughs> well, like I said, I don't do a lot of detail about the violence. <laughs> yeah. Like I would have like, well, they must have really, uh, really, uh, really suffered, you know. Well, just keep bringing it back each chapter. I think he's still alive and suffering in the hospital, and then at the end, <laughs> finally, he dies. You know, something like that, right? You know. You know, you know that it is true. I like, can thinking about that. That there are most of the time when I've when you kill a character. Um, 
I don't know. It's not a character. Maybe you care about. It's like the the, the person is murdered as a as a tool to get the story done. So you know you have to have a murder victim or two or three or four. But uh, sometimes you know, like I've had I've had characters you know where uh, they've died and you know it actually makes you you know sometimes you you think about telling them and you don't. Other times you have to, but then you're sort of sad that you do. The other thing along those lines that. You know, we were talking about supporting characters. Sometimes when you're writing a book, uh, you'll write a character that you think is only one scene. And then that happened with this Janet Wood character I mentioned to you with uh, with Claire. I mean, originally she was going to have, like, some, she just needed to talk to someone. So, well, she'll have this friend and she'll talk to her. And then you'll write the scene and the character will come alive. And you'll be like, no, I I want that. You know, I want that character in the, in the books. I want them to be around for more. Um, so... You know, I think that's a good thing for an author when you actually care, care about your characters almost as if they're real life people. What, do your characters ever surprise you in any other ways? Like, do, do they take the plot off the rails and uh, go with, kind of paint you into a corner? <laughs> yeah, that happens to me a lot. Um, so one of the discussions that always comes up among authors when you go to writers' conferences is do you do you outline, you know, are you, a, are you a plotter or a pantser? You know, which is, do you plot out the whole story beforehand or do you just go by the seat of your pants? And uh, I'm a, like a total pantser. I've never done an outline in my life. Uh, when I start a book, I don't really have any idea what's going to happen or where it's going to go with the characters. Uh, I just have an idea and I sort of just, so I start writing and I keep writing and it generally goes completely, I don't want to say off the rails because that makes it sound like it's bad, but it goes completely in a different direction than I imagine it might be. And uh, and I generally, about middle of the book, I am convinced that I will never be able to finish this book because I have no idea what the ending is going to be. And uh, and then you sort of slog around and then you finally get to the ending. So I mean, that's, that's how I write. I also sometimes will get to the ending and think, should I take one more crazy leap step in the plot and no, that would be too unbelievable or should I just play it safe and, you know, end it here. And I have found that I'm better off pushing the envelope as much as I can because every time I do an extra twist at the end, people are like, Oh my God, I thought it was over. And then there was another twist, you know? Um, so that's, that's, that's very much how I, I write and my characters and, you know, especially Claire, uh, yeah, they surprise me all the, the time, which kind of seems weird because I'm doing it. But I, I yeah, I don't have any uh, I don't have any well thought out plan of what they're going to do. Uh, and, and I've also had, you know, we're talking about characters, bad guys and, and stuff. Uh, I've done this in a couple of books where I've had somebody who you think is very, very sympathetic. And then you twist it at the end and make them. Uh, a bad character, and um, and I've also done it the other way around. Um, you know, where somebody like a Susan Endicott is horrible, but then they do they step up and they do something, and they do something good. So I, it's fun to surprise yourself as a writer. You know, I I like I figure again if I can surprise myself when I'm doing this, I'm probably going to surprise the reader. I just want to say I read a I read a uh, somebody wrote a review of Broadcast Blues this morning that I just read, so it's in my mind, and I I can't quote I, exactly, but it was basically like. I'm reading the book. As we get to the end, I want to shout out to Claire. Why are you so stupid? Don't you see? That's the murderer. That's the murderer, you know. And then, of course, the reviewer says, I had no idea that, you know, Belsky had three more twists coming, and I had no idea what was going to go on. Um, and that's that's kind of what I'm striving for. Hey, listen, so now are you doing uh, social media? Do you have a website? Do you like readers to interact? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. So uh, I have a website. It's uh, www.rgbelsky.com. And uh, uh, I also have a newsletter that uh, that you can sign up for at that website. Um, I'm on uh, Facebook uh, as R.G. Belsky, author. Uh and I'm on uh, Twitter as uh, as at Dick Bell, which is my name at Dick D I C K B E L. Um, and I do, uh, yeah, I do a tremendous amount of social media. Uh, one f one other final thing is, uh, and I'm not even sure if you're aware of this, but I also write a series of books uh, under a pen name, uh, Dana Perry, and uh, uh, those are from a different publisher. And I've published four of those so far. 
but uh, I have uh, actually three more coming out, three, in 2024, starting in April. And uh, the first one's called The Nowhere Girls, and it, uh, surprisingly enough, again features a female. This is a female FBI agent as the main character. So uh, Dana Perry is the same as R.G. Belsky. So if you like R.G. Belsky books, check out Dana Perry, too. Well, there you go. Now, we'll put all that up on our website, and we appreciate you being here. And, of course, the book we were talking about is Broadcast Blues. It's Claire Carlson's Mystery, and it's book six. And the authors are guest, R.G. Belsky. Thank you for being here. Thank you, and I'm glad uh, I'm glad we all got, got through this. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, R.G. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.